Welcome to the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. There are no traffic jams along the extra mile when you're studying for your bar exam. And now your hosts, Jackson Mummy and Megan Saya from Celebration Bar Review. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a special bonus episode of our podcast. We want to talk today about something that is fundamentally going to change the bar exam in the next five years, four or five years, and it is significant. And we wanted to give some additional time to talk about it and let you know what's happening and reassure you a little bit if you're taking the bar right now, maybe give you some things to think about if you're looking at taking the bar a few years down the road. Megan Say is joining me as always, and uh, she's been looking at this testing task force from the National Conference of Bar Examiners in some detail. So Megan, I'm going to let you kick us off today and talk a little bit about what it is that's happening. Why are we talking about this? Yeah, so thanks, Jackson. The National Conference of Bar Examiners has been working for a while now on deciding and determining what their goals are, if they're meeting those goals adequately with the test as it currently is, and if there are any changes that need to be made to the bar exam. So they've had a different series of groups who've come together. They had a testing task force. They've also had input from what they call stakeholders. So people who are a part of the bar admissions in specific states and people who are law school deans, things like that, people who care about the future of the bar exam and what it looks like. So they have decided that they will be fundamentally changing the way that the bar exam looks sometime in the next four to five years. It's a long process. They've already been working on it for more than a year, and it's going to take a while to implement, but they are going to be definitely making some large scale changes to the way the bar exam looks. They're calling it the next generation of bar exam. Yeah, and and they have done a really good job of communicating the the process that they've been following and the work that they've been doing. And I want to just emphasize at the beginning, this is not going to affect you if you're taking the bar exam in the next two or three years. It will not impact you at all. There will be a rollout of this. There will be practice and there'll be implementation and there's a lot of steps along the way. And you might say, why are we talking about it this far in advance? What's your answer to that? Why would we be discussing this today? I think it really helps for a few different ways. One is obviously we always want to be looking towards the future and knowing what direction the bar exam is going in. We certainly work with students who take years off from their studies and then come back to the bar or attorneys who are moving states and need to take a new bar exam. So it's certainly relevant for people who know this isn't something in my two-year plan, but probably within the next five or so years, I'm going to be taking another bar exam. But I think there's also some instruction Constructive pieces in this for current students and the meaning of what's the focus of the examiners. The national conference is really pretty explicitly now saying, hey, we want to move away from the memorization way that the bar has been looking and, and the way that people approach it, because it's not really giving them what they're looking for in terms of people who are admitted to the bar. And it's keeping out certainly a lot of very qualified people who maybe can't or, or struggle with the sort of odd way that skills are tested or not tested on the current iteration of the bar exam. Yeah, and I think it's really interesting that, and we're going to link to this video and to some frequently asked questions that the bar examiners have provided, but they are explicit in saying that this new test is designed to measure the skills that a new attorney needs in practice, not the in-depth knowledge base and specialized skills. And so you're going to hear some subjects have been revised, some have been being dropped out of the exam. The form of the questions is changing. There, virtually everything about this test is going to change, but with the idea of making it more, I, I think, rational, more reasonable, more relatable to what a new attorney practice has to do. So I'm excited about that. I'm also excited because I think, frankly, it's a vindication of what we've been teaching at Celebration Bar Review for decades. And that is that memorizing the law is just not the skill that you need for the bar exam. And it's nice to hear the bar examiners acknowledge that, that that's just really not something that's very useful and that they wanted to get away from it as much as we have been telling people, you really don't need to be doing it. So I think there is a convergence of our methodology and teaching with where the bar exam is headed. And to me, that's really exciting because it means that our students are already 
preparing in many ways for what this new look of the exam is, because it's really what the examiners want it to be anyway. Do you agree with that? Definitely. So I think it's really helpful to start at the outset by looking at what the NCBE is saying the goal of the bar exam is. So they explicitly say it is to protect the public by helping to ensure that those who are newly licensed possess the minimum knowledge and skills to perform activities typically required of an entry level lawyer. All right. So that's the goal. So now if that's where they want to be, then they looked and this task force looked and thought, are we there? Are we, as the test currently stands, is this an accurate representation to get us to where we think we want to be? And they determined that there were some changes and tweaks that needed to be made in order to better meet that goal. So, yeah, and I think it's important. I'm going to uh, use some screenshots from their video that the NCB has put out, the testing task force. But I think it's important to help set a, a foundation for this because the current bar exam, at least the uniform bar exam, is made up of these three components, the essays, the performance test, and the multi-state bar exam. That's the measure that we use, but it doesn't quite meet the needs, does it, that the examiners wanted. Exactly, exactly. So instead, the examiners have, or excuse me, the task force has recommended and the examiners have accepted these recommendations, which they're calling their guiding views. So this is a big list, but take from it what you will. So first, they feel that the bar exam should test fewer subjects and should test less broadly and deeply within the subjects that are covered. So that means that it, I think great news, certainly for people who are feeling a bit overwhelmed by all of the different things that are tested on the exam on the UBE. This will be, you'll see that when we get to that, that the subjects are being cut down a bit and that w- even within that, they're expecting a little bit less breadth and depth than there currently is. Because as you guys know, real property There is a lot of information that you have to cram in your head. But again, I think it's going in part towards that understanding that it's really not helpful for the profession to force every single new attorney to memorize a million facts about real property that then leave their head the moment they walk out of the exam and are never put into practice again. It's not really a, it doesn't really meet that goal of minimum competency in, in areas and activities typically required of new attorneys. So that's the first. Also that there be greater emphasis placed on the assessment of lawyering skills to better reflect real world practice and the types of activities newly licensed lawyers perform. So that's what we'll talk more in depth about this, but that would basically be saying that, hey, we'd really love to test if potential attorneys are capable of performing the tasks rather than memorizing a set of facts. All right. Next is that the exam should remain affordable. So that's good news that fairness and accessibility for all candidates must continue to be ensured. Good, obviously. And that the portability of the uniform bar exam score should be maintained. So don't stress if you're worried about that. They want to continue within UBE jurisdictions, continue to have it be portable, the score portable throughout all of the jurisdictions. So I think on the whole, Jackson, really great guiding principles in my mind. I think they are too. And the examiners have put all of that together. They've taken what Megan just described and they've put it into a series of six preliminary recommendations that we're going to walk through together, but they all are built on those guiding principles. And one of the things you're going to notice is that when it comes to the content of the exam, as Megan said, you're going to see a shift in the content. We're going to go more towards what are called foundational concepts and principles. That would be the subjects that any lawyer newly in practice would want to know about and have uh, the ability to work with. But then also, and this is what's a little different, the idea of foundational skills You're going to need skills like legal research and writing and the ability to analyze problems in a different way. And so you're going to see those things come together. But some of the things you're used to in the bar exam, like it being given twice a year, like your score being portable, those things will continue to occur. That's not going to change. The examiners are committed to making sure that this test doesn't get more expensive so that you can still continue to take it. And... One of the interesting things, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, is that while we have currently at-home online exams being given in a lot of jurisdictions, the examiners still believe that an in-person exam 
although on computer or at a computer center is the best way to give the test. So they're not uh, abandoning the idea of going someplace to take a test. And I think that's important to keep in mind. And then the last thing I would say in terms of foundational pieces is that the way that the scoring will be done will remain in what's called a compensatory model. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment as well. But what it means is that you can't pull pieces out of this new test and score them independently and say, you've got to get a passing score in one part of the test and then a passing score in another part of a test and a passing score in a third part of the test. It's all going to be put together in a compensatory model. And that's going to have implications for states like California, Florida, Georgia, states that don't use the uniform bar exam because it's going to present a question of whether or not they have to switch to the all new bar exam or abandon the national conference entirely. And that is an that's a wide open question today, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Jackson, do you want to talk uh, first about the what it means that the examiners are saying they're going to be moving to an integrated examination? How is that going to be different than the current format of MEE, MPT, and MBE? Yeah, it's, it's a great one. And you see here that in this chart where it says structure and format, they talk about this integrated exam. Let me just share with you some of the, the graphics that the examiners gave us about this idea of an integrated exam. When we think about the current bar exam, it has distinct components. So your essay score is different than your performance test score, and that's different than your MBE score. Under this new testing approach, you're going to be given a large scenario or a package, and it will look like a performance test does right now. It'll have a, an assignment and a problem. There'll be a library and uh, case files. But then from that one scenario, as you see on the screen here, the examiners will be testing you on what they call FC and P. We're all going to get used to FC and P. It means foundational concepts and principles. And that means the subjects that are being tested. And you might have within this package some essay questions, some performance test types of items, things to do, write a client letter or brief. There might be some short answer, short response kinds of questions. We haven't seen that for a long time in most bar exam jurisdictions. And you might even have some multiple choice questions built off of that same scenario. Then you notice that there's also this thing called FS. That's the foundational skills. And the examiners say that the foundational skills are things like research and writing. We already know the writing part is there. They say this, and it kills me, but they use the word issue spotting. But as I understand issue spotting, it still means finding conflicts and disputes and doing the analysis. But it also goes on to client counseling and advising and negotiation and dispute resolution and client relationships. So all of those things might be drawn out of one scenario that you would be given, and that would be the integrated test. So instead of having a separate set of multiple choice questions and a separate set of essays and a separate set of performance tests, each of which are graded independently, you get one large grade out of this entire integrated exam. So there's a mix of item types and formats. What's your thought about the integrated exam? I love it. I love the idea. I think that instead of trying to shift gears constantly, I love the idea of, hey, we're living in this one world, just like in the real world, when you have a client who comes in and they have these specific problems that you need to deal with. And then each one of them might come up with have different solution, right? With one, you may need to do some mediation. With another, maybe you need to write a letter, right? There's all, there might be another where you're going to be doing some writing a brief for the court. And so it's much more realistic and real world. And I think rather than having to shift your mindset over and over again within the test, what a great thing to get one fact package and be able to use it and manipulate it and have a full understanding of it as you go along. So on the whole, I think this holistic exam or integrated exam is really a great idea. Yeah, I do too. It's much more practical, right? And here's a, an example that the examiners gave that you would have in this integrated exam, this one fact pattern, you might have the call of the question you see there on the right, and then you'd have a case file in the library, and then you'd get all of these different kinds of test questions, uh, multiple choice, rank order, constructed response, short answer, essay. There's all sorts of things that they can do off of it. 
Now, you might say, how would they be able to do that? One of the reasons is that they can now use computers to deliver the test questions. So they've got a lot more flexibility here and the ability to record responses and to uh, be able to highlight and do word processing and all these other things. So one of the advantages of the experience of the last year with COVID is that the bar examiners have had to accelerate their understanding of computer testing, computer proctoring, and computer delivery. I think that they feel more confident today, certainly than they did a year ago, that they can do that. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of that. But I wanna emphasize that what you're gonna see is multiple types of formats on the same test form. So you're gonna have one problem with multiple kinds of things that you have to do. And so no longer do we expect that there'll be a day just called the MBE. And that's why I say it's problematic for states that don't use the uniform bar exam, because let's take California as an example. They write their own essays, their own performance tests, and then they use the National Conference multi-state exam. The MBE looks like it's going away as a separate standalone test. So what does California do? Do they drop their entire test and go to the UBE, this new integrated exam? Or do they say, forget it, we're going to stay with our own test and no more MBE? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure anybody knows. So if you're a California bar taker, or a Florida bar taker, or a Georgia bar taker, or any state that does not in the UBE, it could be very interesting to see what, what happens. Obviously, from a business standpoint, it seems to me that what the examiners are doing here, what the national conference is doing, is they want to get everybody on their program, everybody doing the same test all around the country. And that would be great. You'd have portability, you'd have score reliability across jurisdictions. There's a lot of things that would be good for, but I don't know. I mean, we've seen that battle go back and forth, haven't we? <laughs> Yeah, certainly. Jackson, do you have any thoughts with talking about that the MBE might not look like the MBE anymore, where we have 200 questions? How do we have the score reliability that we've had in the past? That was the big issue, right? In October of 2020 was, gosh, we're only doing 100 MBE questions. So the NCBE said, hey, this is not technically an MBE, and it doesn't have the reliability statistically that we see with the normal MBE. What happens with this yeah. new exam? Yeah, it's a great question. And I thought the conference, the national conference and the testing task force gloss over this. I think that they know it's a problem potentially. And they say, we're going to make sure psychometrically that it's reliable, whatever we do. But of course, how do we measure that? How do we com uh, compare that to previous years to make sure that the bar exam remains equitable and fair to people that take it five years from now from people that take it today? And so if you look at the scoring uh, recommendation, they're gonna talk about this compensatory scoring model. In other words, you, you look at one big score for everything and that when you've got that, you'll get a single combined score. So they're taking the emphasis away from the multi-state only, which changes a lot of things. A lot of jurisdictions, the MBE is scored first, and then based on that score, uh, the amount of attention is given to the applicant's written work. And now that would go away entirely. I think the MBE, will cease to exist as we know it today. I just don't think there'll be a 200 question multiple choice exam. I don't think the examiners, the NCBE examiners, intend to support that product after they go to this product. So then the question is, would states create their own multiple choice? Florida did this in October. Other states might do it going forward. And I think it, it is an open question as to what's going to happen, but I would not invest in a multi-state only bar prep company right now. Yeah. <laughs> point that I wanted to, to bring up here as we're talking about the score reliability is that the examiners have said as well, the NCB has said that they would love to make the test a little bit shorter, but they'll only do that if the what's needed for validity and reliability of the scores can be maintained. So that's another piece to tell you. Of course, that's huge on their list of requirements is that no matter what this test looks like, they need to make sure that it is valid and reliable and that the scores don't suddenly start going crazy and we have have huge problems with people not being admitted or or claims of unfairness or bias or things like that within yeah that. and and they are talking about and i think this is significant uh, what they call a single event at or near the point of licensure in other words you won't be able to take this new exam until at least the last semester of law school or graduation and that will be based on a jurisdictional decision there are a few jurisdictions that still let people take the exam in their last semester of law school 
there was some discussion about multiple test times over a period of time while you were in school. They rejected that for the reasons that you just talked about, Megan. It's just, it's inequitable. It's expensive. There's a lot of difficulty there. And so it will continue to be a two-day exam. That's what they've committed to, 12 hours of testing over two days to be given twice a year. So that's what we know in terms of what their goals are. Could that change between now and 2025, 2026? I think it could, but that's where they at least have started out in terms of what they wanted to do. So I think that kind of gives us the overview of uh, these different pieces. We know the content is changing. We know that the structure and format are changing, but the frequency of the exam, the timing of the exam, those things aren't changing. The delivery mode will be computerized. One thing the examiners did say that was interesting, they were explicit that the days of paper and pen or paper and pencil are gone, that that will be gone when this new test comes into play. So if you're somebody that hand wrote and you would expect to do that in the future for some reason, that simply doesn't appear to be an option anymore. It's unless you have a accommodation. Yes. And and they've said they will try to make, they will certainly accommodate people with disabilities and people that have specific needs. They want to make this test fair and accessible. How that would play out, it's not clear because they are definitely relying in large part on the computer to generate the documents that are necessary and to work from there. So we'll see how that comes out as well. But I think certainly we're looking at a different test in that regard. Do we want to talk next about the actual subjects that are being tested? Is that a good place to to turn our attention next? Yeah, sure. As we said earlier, the breadth of subjects is getting contracted. So I think that's a good news um, for people who are going to be taking it a few years from now. So let's talk through the old subjects. I'll, I'll compare and contrast as we go through. So CivPro remains the same. Contracts is still there, although now they are specifying, um, including UCC Article 2. Evidence will remain the same. Torts remains the same. For business associations, it's now business associations, including agency. Notice that is not, uh, it used to be agency and partnership, corporations and LLCs. So there's a difference. Con law will remain the same. Crim law, it used, they used to call it crim law and procedure. And now we've got crim law and constitutional protections impacting criminal proceedings. So where there's the overlap of, I think, Fourth Amendment uh, search and seizure of areas. And then real property remains the same. Then notice what's not on this list. No conflict of laws, family law, trusts and estates, or UCC 9. I'm heartbroken about losing secure transactions. <laughs> I just want to tell you, I just learned it. <laughs> After 30 years, I think I, I finally got it. So yeah, so it's going to be s- subjects that are more generic. I thought it was interesting that they dropped family law because it seemed to me that a lot of new lawyers needed to practice family law or did practice family law, but the examiners felt that was not a necessity to understand. And so that it was too specialized and they dropped that out. It made me think of Florida, where Florida really recently, was it a year or two ago? It was probably in 2019, huh? I think it was pre-COVID. They dropped the domestic relations and pieces. They dropped some family law pieces from their exam as well. I think it's just a very specialized area of law that, while it is a very common area of law, can have some nuanced rules that 90% of attorneys probably never deal with in their practice. Well, and it's also very state specific and the examiners are clearly trying to write a generic uniform bar exam. And so something that's highly state specific just doesn't fit into that at all. I also thought it was interesting in civil procedure, the comments that they made about wanting to make sure that subject contained uh, a testing of constitutional protections like due process and service of process and the broader concepts and not so much the, the esoteric features of the, the subject. I, I, I heard, maybe it was wishful thinking, but I think we're, we're moving away a little bit from the gotcha kind of questions of civil procedure. And I think jurisdiction certainly is still included within that broad topic, don't you? Oh, yes. Yes. I would certainly expect that to be a part of it is still. Yeah. yeah. So fewer subjects, more generalized subjects, but again, no multi-state where you're studying seven multi-state subjects and then which one of the 14 other subjects could be tested for essays. So everything would come out of this group of subjects and it might be that you would be doing something that would implicate 
two or three or four or five of these subjects within the problem and have some multiple choice, some performance tests, some essays, some short answer. So you will have to be prepared in all of these areas. I think that is a significant change and movement. So how does all of this take place? How's it going to happen? Slowly. (laughs) (laughs) very slowly (laughs) yeah so they're continuing to meet and i think as you said at the beginning they've been very transparent most of their or many of their meetings are recorded and posted online so people can see them any member of the public who's interested they have a great website they've put out faqs they've put out videos things you can watch to, to help explain and they have invited people to email with questions things like that if you're concern, certainly reach out to them. I think that they are open-eyed about the huge undertaking that this is and how it may be received. Certainly right now, I think there's fewer people who are knowing, gosh, I'm planning on taking it in four to five years. Those people aren't even in law school yet. There's not so much of the panic, but I know that, and they think they know that within a couple of years, there will start to be a bit of a rising panic of, wait, but how do I study? How do I help my students study for this exam? So they will be putting out study materials before the first one's ever given they will give, they say they will give examples. They will show people how it's done. I do feel confident in that, that they seem to be really clear eyed about the potential panic that this could cause within the bar taker community and that they want to mitigate that and help people to feel prepared for that first exam. Obviously it would be catastrophic if they switched to the new exam and it was just a complete failure and very few people passed and it would, everybody walked out of it in tears thinking that was the worst experience of my life. They don't want that to happen just as much as you don't want that to happen. So I think they are planning on helping give people preparation when we get closer. Now, of course, we don't really know what that looks like yet because they don't really know what that looks like yet until they've started to create their first test runs of what this exam will look like. Yeah. And I certainly would say as a company that for over 20 years now has been a licensee at the National Conference, we expect that we will continue to have access to study materials and sample test questions to help candidates prepare for the exams where this test is being given. If states like California, Florida, Georgia, others stay out of this realm, we will continue to have the uh, tests that they offer, whatever those look like as well. But it is gonna take time to uh, bring this into to play. They're gonna start the implementation process. Actually, they've started it this month and they are starting to work through field testing and doing analysis and review and figuring out how to establish the psychometric method to equate and scale scores, that all takes time. One question that I know some people are gonna ask is what happens to the professional responsibility exam, the MPRE? So the MPRE is, according to the examiners, the most important knowledge area that that came out in their surveys, and they will continue to offer it as a separate assessment, which means, as best we can tell, it will continue to be a multiple choice exam and nothing is changing there. However, professional responsibility may be part of the discussion in the integrated exam, even though it is not a specific subject area, but it is part of the foundational skills of legal analysis, quiet counseling and advising. MPRE looks like it's still a part of this for the future, and you should expect that you will probably have to take that. Another question that the examiners responded to was the idea of whether or not this new integrated exam would be open book. And I thought that their interest, their answer was interesting. They are saying it, it will not be an open book exam. You will not be able to bring your own reference materials or notes to the test. Instead, you'll use the closed universe of legal resources as you do right now with a performance test. And so there might be legal resources like statutes and cases and rules, and that the foundational skills are not being measured on the basis of your memorization. Therefore, you will literally be tested through this closed package and there would be an MPT type of library. But the idea for that is to make the exam more realistic and reduce the amount of legal knowledge that you must commit to memory for the exam And then the examiners say, we want to emphasize skills such as interpreting and applying law. 
again, I feel pretty good about that. That's what we've been telling people to do for a long time. So I feel like this new test is moving right into our wheelhouse. We're excited about it at Celebration Bar Review. We think that it really reinforces what we've been teaching people. And I think the exam is not going to be one way on day X and completely different on day Y. I think there's going to be some transition in this as the examiners start to get a feeling for what they want to do. And so I think that's really good news for those of you taking the exam in the next three or four years, because you may see some questions and some performance tests that are hidden uh, uh, tests of this new integrated approach. And I think that's going to be consistent with what we've been talking about and teaching. You have any other thoughts about that, about the integration of this going forward? I know it's a lot of information, but I think it's good news all the way around. If I was planning on taking the bar in the next five to seven years, I think I would feel good about the direction that it's going. Yeah, I think one question that might come up is I, I might be able to take the exam in two or three years. Should I wait and hold out for the new exam? Tough question, isn't it? Yeah, it is. On the whole, though, I think we always have the same advice, which is just take it. Don't push the bar exam off. In this case, if you could take it in two to three years and you're thinking, maybe I push it back, we better the devil. We don't know. It, it could be that this new exam takes six years to push out, seven years to push out. There's no guarantees. We also just don't really know what it's going to look like yet. And so I really would not delay at this point, I would not delay for the purposes of trying to take the new one. Maybe my answer is different when we know they've said July of X year, we're going to do the next one. And you decide, mm, I was going to take it February of that year. So maybe I'll go take the July one. That might be a different answer. I'm not sure. But yeah, certainly right now, if you're planning on taking the test, take the test. Do not wait for the new exam to come out. Yeah. And the examiners are pretty clear that the existing test is reliable, it's predictable, it's a good solid test. It's not that the test is functionally not working. They are simply trying to make it conform to best practices in the professional testing arena. So looking at dentists and doctors and architects and accountants, that's really where they're trying to go with this. And so the test that we've got is a good one. Also, whenever you change a test, there's a lot of uncertainty. I think a lot of people will probably hang back and not try to take that test when it first comes out, wait and see what it is and how it goes. So you really don't want to be caught up in that maelstrom that's inevitably going to happen. And yeah, I think their best plan is four to five years, but really there's a lot, there's a lot to be done in that period of time. And there's a lot of jurisdictional negotiation that's going to have to happen. I think if they can't convince Florida and California to join them, it's going to create this really interesting duality of the bar exam. And we're going to really see what happens. This sort of feels like the old days of the uh, American Football Conference and the National Football Conference. Which one of those is going to be uh, dominant here? So I'm curious to see how all that plays out. In any event, over this period of time, we will undoubtedly be talking about the testing task force and the integrated exam. We'll be using new ideas like foundational skills and foundational concepts and principles. And you'll hear those terms talked about a lot. We'll keep you up to date on all of it. In today's episode, we are putting links to all of the material from the testing task force, their recent video that we encourage you to watch. It's about 30 minutes in length and they're frequently asked questions. I think you'll find those really helpful and we'll keep you informed if there are major changes, but we wanted you to be aware of it today. So thanks, Megan, for being here. Appreciate you uh, bringing your expertise to this. I'm excited to see where this goes. And uh, it's always fun as teachers, isn't it? A new challenge, something else to look at. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what they come up with and definitely to help figure out the best way to prepare students to take it. Yeah, good thing we've got several years to figure it out as well. <laughs> Listen, thank you everybody for being with us. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening and watching the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers at celebrationbarreview.com.